Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, <clears throat> and uh, welcome to today's uh, Provost conversation on teaching and learning. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on a, on a slightly different type of topic. We're going to be talking about modeling and simulation, and I'm just <clears throat> speaking with our presenter here, uh, Dr. John Sokolowski, um, because m many of our uh, particularly high school students don't really know yet much about what modeling and simulation is uh, and, and how they can make uh, a good career choice from that. Um, <clears throat> so this is all part of educating us here at the university as, uh, as exactly what, what we're using and especially how it can be used in teaching. Um, as in addition to John, um, to Dr. Sokolowski, uh, who is the executive director for VMASC, um, we hope we also will have a, a, another of his colleagues, Catherine Banks, um, who is um, perhaps able to join us today. She's off uh, at a different, uh, a different meeting at the moment, but we hope that she can join us later on. And basically, um, what they're going to be working on, as it says in the title, how to teach students to analyze um, their work uh, through modeling. Dr. Sokolowski um, is uh, actually a retired captain, right? Navy captain. Um, he's been with the center at VMASC, the Virginia uh, Modeling and Simulation Center in Suffolk, since uh, 2001, so he's had a good time there now. Uh, he's all four books, and a couple of them quite recently, as I remember, and is a number of journal articles on modeling and simulation. And his um, research interests are really about um, how to uh, use the modeling and simulation in, in decision making, and particularly um, in social systems. So if Dr. Banks is able to join us, and she's certainly a co-author on this talk. Um, she's a research associate professor at VMASC, and she does a lot of work on human behavior and human modeling, which of course has applications in both social sciences, health sciences, and a, uh, business, and a whole range of different areas. And she is the co-editor or co-author of, of four books herself. And so today we're going to be looking at how we're going to use the software um, to uh, teach students how to analyze some. Handing over to, to, to John. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Simpson. Uh, it's certainly uh, a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you all uh, this afternoon uh, about uh, uh, modeling simulation in general and how we use some of this capability from a, a teaching standpoint. Um, one of the challenges, as the provost alluded to, was to just make everybody aware of, of what modeling and simulation is. Uh, it's a challenge because it's really all around us. Uh, at every point, some of us have done some kind of modeling and simulation. Um, so it, it's very ubiquitous. Uh, but what it has done is really developed into its own discipline. <clears throat> uh, there are many users of simulation tools out there, uh, especially in the, the engineering and, and science area. But it takes some specific knowledge to develop those capabilities. And that's really where the academic focus is uh, on the, the technical side. Um, the, the requisite knowledge to be able to understand how to model something, especially a new concept, and then how to turn that into a simulation that allows, to look, allows us to look at that model over time. So that's really been our focus on the modeling and simulation uh, area. Uh, sort of in conjunction with that is to help others understand how to use these tools and apply them in areas that may not have been uh, used to modeling the simulation in the past. Certainly that is the case in many of the, the social and, and human behavior areas. And so about five years ago, Dr. Banks and I uh, started a course uh, called uh, Modeling Global Events. And our idea was to put together the engineering students that have the background, the technical background in modeling simulation with folks from the social sciences, so from international studies, from political science, from uh, business, 
and make them understand each other's realm. Uh, not so much from the technical standpoint, but really from the conceptual modeling standpoint. Um, so the, the engineering folks need to understand how to model these social systems and the social folks need to know what they need to provide uh, to actually help develop those models. And uh, the, the way we found to do that was just to make them work together, give them a challenge, uh, a problem to model, and uh, help them through some of the processes to do that. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is uh, sort of that methodology and how we've incorporated the, the technology piece into uh, getting uh, these uh, sort of varied background group of students to, to uh, think in this uh, sort of systematic way. So I'm going to uh, talk about the why and the how, and then talk a little bit about the software uh, to show you that uh, really any of you can do this uh, with a little bit of, uh, of uh, knowledge. So why modeling? To help us understand uh, all of the things around us and to maybe help make decisions about how those things behave or what we can do to cause them to behave in a certain way, we really need to know the underlying characteristics of those, and I'm going to call them systems, because they really are systems in some context. Um, and so uh, understanding what variables govern the behavior of those systems and what links those variables together starts to form the, uh, the method to be able to uh, characterize them in a modeling format. And so uh, we uh, look at um, uh, how to do that from both a qualitative aspect and a quantitative aspect. Especially on the social side, many of the variables are much more on a qualitative standpoint. Uh, hard to characterize numerically, but uh, there are ways to help translate that qualitative assessment into some kind of quantitative representation that we can incorporate into a computational model. And so we kind of teach that approach. Um, <clears throat> what that does is start to build an understanding of how you approach these different modeling efforts. And that's really uh, the, the biggest thing we try to get across is, is that kind of understanding, especially for the, the social science folks. <clears throat> um, there are lots of different ways to, uh, to kind of manifest this. Uh, we use a, a case study approach where we take real world kinds of uh, events, uh, help them understand what those events were about, and then talk about the approach to do that modeling. And so that's the case study approach. You can also take the, uh, the use case approach, which is sort of a contrived piece. Uh, that helps you formulate uh, new kinds of ideas uh, and put together that modeling approach for things that, that really haven't existed before. Certainly the input parts are important. Uh, that makes up those variables and what characterizes those variables. What we're after is the output. Uh, how does that system behave? What kind of information do we get that allows us to either make some decisions or maybe just understand the behavior of that system a little bit better? Uh, there, there's really two reasons to do modeling. One is to solve a problem, uh, and that's kind of what most people think. But the other reason is to help you understand the system better. You may not be able to completely model it or to completely solve it, but going through that modeling process helps you understand the behavior of that system a little bit more. And that leads to more human insight and better ways maybe to approach uh, the understanding of that system or making decisions about that system. So the output piece is very important. Uh, what was done for uh, a long time in the uh, 
experimentation process uh, was to form a hypothesis and try to test it. Well, um, that works okay in some cases, especially in uh, uh, tangible kinds of things that you can test. Um, but there are a lot of systems that we just aren't able to test. Either we can't manipulate them from a real world standpoint, or we're not allowed to from, for all kinds of different reasons. But simulation allows us to kind of put an intermediate step in there, do some of that uh, manipulation, and uh, look at what the potential results are, and then possibly implement those from a, a testing standpoint. So it adds a new dimension to the whole area of scientific study. <clears throat> um, certainly the hypothesis lets us uh, work with um, uncertainty that exists. You know, that's what we're trying to do is hypothesize about uh, possible solutions or decisions. Um, but remember, these uh, problems are very often very dynamic and uh, they contain uh, uh, a, a huge amount of feedback that influences things not only on the, uh, the input side but on the output side. And so uh, understanding those feedback concepts, kind of putting them all together and then testing them in simulation is very important. Um, that's done through the modeling piece and uh, uh, gives us that uh, ability to, to do that testing and uh, probably one of the more significant parts is to visualize what's going on. Uh, so a lot of the simulation capability uh, has a visual component to it. Uh, that helps us as humans better see what's going on inside the computer uh, where just ones and zeros doing a lot of computation, not very readily meaningful to us from an interpretation standpoint. But if we have ways of visualizing that uh, from a, a graphic standpoint or a numerical standpoint, that then allows us to certainly understand what's going on from the, the simulation standpoint. Okay, so uh, how do we model? Um, I'm gonna take a case study and kind of walk you through the process. Uh, it's probably the easiest way for me to get across uh, the point of how we go about uh, modeling this. So this is one of the, the case studies that we use in our course, uh, looking at the insurgency in Colombia. Um, from a historical standpoint, uh, the insurgency in Colombia has been going on for several decades. Uh, there are multiple insurgent groups that uh, exist in that, uh, that country and uh, certainly was a challenge for the Colombian government to try to keep that insurgency under control so that there's a, uh, a meaningful rule of law and that uh, the, uh, the, the country doesn't fall into to chaos and, and anarchy. So um, there's a lot of uh, decisions that have to be made from a policy standpoint on what to put in place to make sure that they, they can mitigate that insurgency. Uh, how do you test out those policies? That's what we want to kind of look at. So first of all, you have to understand a little bit about the problem. So we have the students uh, do some research in the area of the Colombian insurgency, uh, understand uh, who the players are, what factors uh, govern their motivation for doing what they're doing, and then start to look at how to capture that from a modeling standpoint. So this is the, uh, the task, the assessment, and the research question that we give them. Uh, and uh, uh, that's sort of the starting point. Uh, what are we trying to model? Uh, you have to kind of understand that up front. You cannot build a uh, model that encompasses everything. Um, uh, that is uh, an, an impossible task. Um, there's a, a mathematician that existed back in the early uh, 20th century by the name of Gödel. Um, he was uh, famous for proving what could be proven and what could not be proven. <laughs> 
Um, how that relates to modeling simulation is um, anything that's a truly random system can't be modeled by anything less than the actual system itself, the real world system. So you've got to kind of understand that up front. You're never going to produce a perfect model of a truly random system. But that doesn't mean you can't get close. And so that's what we tried to, to concentrate on is how well can we characterize the system? Do we understand the, at least the key factors that are governing its behavior, if not all of them? And that starts with what we're going to model. And it's really got to be fairly specific, trying to uh, go to a very large, broad piece um, often uh, results in frustration because it just becomes too complicated. So making sure you have a, a concise uh, task of what you're trying to model is, is certainly what's up front. Um, so uh, after the students uh, take a look at this, we kind of walk through how we're going to characterize that particular situation. And uh, what, uh, what we came up with was a set of indices that uh, help characterize the key elements from both a government standpoint and an insurgency standpoint to understand the behavior of that system. And so you see these indices here. Uh, polity, which uh, has, to go to, has to deal with uh, how uh, democratic a, a governance uh, uh, capability is, certainly the social, the human rights piece, the insurgency piece itself, and then what the, uh, the government is doing on a counterinsurgency standpoint. The, the reason we chose this concept of, uh, of developing a set of indices is because it allows us to uh, kind of uh, baseline a, uh, a set of information. So, you know, what's an index? Well, it's kind of like what everything else is compared to. Uh, and so if we can capture the behavior of this system at a point in time, then we can use that as a starting point and understand how that system can evolve over time based on these policy changes, okay? Uh, so just to give you an example of what this looks like, and this is where we start to get into the qualitative uh, conversion into a quantitative representation. So as an example, the, the polity index. Uh, we look at a set of factors that uh, govern or describe or influence this whole concept of polity, both from a, a positive standpoint and from a negative standpoint. So you see supporting factors, you see detractor factors, and then we kind of assess them from a, a rating scale. So we use a Likert scale. I think everybody's familiar with uh, hey, characterize this thing from one to five. That's a Likert scale. Uh, the, the challenge is kind of knowing how broad to make that Likert scale because uh, most people can't make a differentiation of a hundred different bins from one to a hundred, but you can probably make a differentiation between one to five or one to seven and put some verbal description to that. So now getting that scale piece correct is certainly part of the challenge uh, when doing this uh, conversion from quali quantitative, qualitative to quantitative. Uh, and so the table helps us to do that. Uh, we look at sort of the summation then of all of these factors and that tells us or gives us an indication whether we have positive polity or you know sort of good democratic governance or negative poly polities or sort of not very good democratic governance. We do the same thing for the other indices that I talked about before and that starts to give us a characterization of these major elements. Um, how do you assess these? Well, this is where some subject matter expertise comes in. Uh, you need to have folks that understand what is uh, going on at, in the particular system, in this case, Columbia and the insurgency and the government. So you need to consult some subject matter experts that help you characterize the, uh, the values of these uh, uh, qualitative kinds of elements. Uh, and so we have, you know, the students walk through and, 
uh, based on their research of, of the, uh, the background of this thing, uh, try to make those kinds of assessments, uh, get the, uh, the numbers uh, uh, supported by those kinds of uh, uh, qualitative uh, pieces of research. Uh, and then uh, we uh, have to summarize those factors, uh, kind of come up with an overall composite of which way this system is leaning. And so uh, uh, we've got to, uh, to combine them. Uh, we actually broke this down into um, uh, two different time periods. Uh, remember I talked about this concept of an index. Well, we have to have something to index to. And uh, I'll show you in a minute uh, the data that exists for the time periods here. But what we saw was from the period of 1993 to about 2001, the uh, uh, policies that were in place by the Colombian government were very consistent. Uh, and so uh, that was sort of a non-changing environment and we could represent that period of time by this uh, characterization of these index values. Uh, that gives us that starting point. In the, the 2001 time frame, a new government came in place by President Uribe and he put in place a lot of changes that affected what was going on from an insurgency standpoint. So that's the point where now the model has changed. We need to reassess what's going on and use the model we developed in that beginning time frame to kind of predict what was going to happen in the following years based on these changes in policy. And so that's uh, uh, certainly the challenge behind the model. Uh, what policies am I putting in place that are going to allow this uh, uh, change to occur and, and are they going to be e effective based on what the model is telling us. Uh, remember this is not an absolute predictor kind of thing but it does give us sort of an indication of are we headed in the right direction. Uh, so we uh, develop these composite scores, uh, put them together and then uh, uh, walk the students through how do we incorporate this now into a model of what's going on. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, in conjunction with the course, we teach three different modeling paradigms. Uh, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, and game theory. Uh, those are chosen because they are good modeling paradigms to represent uh, social dynamic kinds of systems and uh, uh, we help them understand the characteristics of those and which ones uh, are best for certain kinds of problems. For the Colombian insurgency we're looking at a dynamic system that's uh, from a macro point of view and uh, over a fairly uh, long period of time and that lends itself to uh, a modeling concept called system dynamics. And uh, system dynamics actually grew out of the area of business and economy uh, by uh, uh, Professor uh, Jay Forrester from MIT who developed this kind of uh, methodology. Uh, but we have and others have extended it to uh, a modeling tool that can be used in lots of different areas of, uh, of study. So, um, we help the students understand that aspect of it. So um, this is where we get into the software piece. Um, Vensim is a, uh, a piece of software that uh, facilitates the development of system dynamics models. Um, it's free to the students uh, and uh, as part of the, the CLT process here we were able to get the software in place to uh, help promote the course and to, uh, to you know, provide it to the, the students to do this kind of analysis. So um, it is a, a commercial piece of software. It is used in uh, lots of high-end modeling situations. Uh, the students get uh, a couple of benefits. They get to work with this kind of software um, for uh, free, uh, so they get introduced to it. Uh, but I think m the greater benefit is uh, it allows them to start putting 
the visual representation in place of this model. So that's what we're going to take a look at next. Uh, this is a typical uh, system dynamics kind of representation called the stock and flow diagram. Uh, the um, boxes that you see are the uh, stock variables. Um, they are the quantities we are interested in capturing. So in our case, we were interested in looking at the number of insurgents that were uh, populating Columbia over a period of time. Well, to get there, um, you've got to kind of start in the beginning. So you start with the general population of Columbia and ask yourself, how do these, uh, how do those, a portion of that population turn into an insurgent? Well, there's sort of an intermediate piece uh, that we defined as dissidents, which were sort of nonviolent insurgents. Uh, and uh, so uh, some portion of the population becomes dissident, uh, and at that point, they either go on to be an insurgent or the uh, government uh, uh, appeases them and they come back to being just part of the regular population. Um, coupled with that, are all of the factors that start to influence the behavior of this transition. What's in between here are the, uh, the rates of change. Uh, so these little butterfly looking things, they're actually valve symbols if you were a mechanical engineer, uh, but they represent the control of flow of these entities between the boxes. And so we're looking at the rate uh, that the susceptible population is becoming dissidents, we're looking at the rates that dissidents are becoming insurgents, and we're looking at the factors that we have identified that make the, this all happen. So these are all connected by lines that represent the connections among the variables. Uh, you hope that these are causal kinds of connections, um, but often that's somewhat difficult to absolutely prove. So there's some causal relationships, but maybe the best you can get to is a correlation. Um, that's okay as long as you understand the difference uh, between the causal piece, which is a direct influence, and the correlation piece, which is an indicator, but maybe not uh, the true causation factor. Um, so we try to understand, uh, uh, like for the population, you know, what goes into the growth, uh, the indices that we talked about that uh, govern or uh, influence what the government is doing, uh, what the insurgents are doing from a, uh, a recruitment standpoint, and uh, what the government's doing from a counterinsurgency standpoint. So now the students have a way to visualize all of the pieces, or at least the major pieces, that are influencing what's happening in this system and uh, uh, have now a conceptual way to think about uh, what's going on. Uh, what we find often is that, uh, especially on the social science side, a, a student can describe in a paragraph what's going on very well. Well, to get to the modeling piece, <laughs> it takes much more than a paragraph. Um, and so we help them understand the detail at which they have to get into. So you saw that list of uh, polity factors. Uh, when we totaled all of the factors up, uh, totaled up to 128 different pieces of information that went into these indices. Um, uh, identifying those, linking those, evaluating those is much more than a paragraph description of what's going on. Uh, so they, they finally get that concept. Uh, but uh, we've had students tell us, man, this gave me a much better understanding of how this thing is working, uh, having to gone through this kind of, uh, of exercise. Uh, so now we have to kind of mathematically implement this model so we can look at it from a, a simulation standpoint. How does it play out over time? Um, so, uh, underlying the software are the ability to put in some mathematical representations. 
Uh, each one of these boxes is computed by uh, calculus through an integral. Um, it's really a summation of the rates. Um, they are influenced by these other variables which have various uh, algebraic combinations that look like that. Um, we certainly help the, uh, the students that don't come from a uh, deep math background uh, understand really what this means because we don't go into this level of detail uh, other than to show them hey there is some significant pieces of math behind how the computation part of this is taking place that's done through the software so they don't have to worry about developing necessarily the equations they can go in and say ah okay I need these variables they need to be combined in this way it's a kind of point and click drag and drop and the software gives them the uh, proper equation uh, as long as they kind of followed up the process. And uh, we have to give them some input variables. The model's got to have something to start out with. And uh, so we give them uh, the, the basic pieces of uh, data that they need uh, in addition to the analysis for the, the polity index. And uh, all models go through a series of assumptions. Uh, very important to state what your assumptions are when you build that model. Um, you can always be criticized for the, uh, the output of your model, but as long as you articulate what your assumptions are, you can defend what you did. Um, uh, assuming you didn't do any mathematical errors. Uh, but identifying those assumptions goes to that here's sort of the limitations of my model here's what I did include here's what I did include why I did that why I didn't do that so it identifies those uh, strengths and limitations and uh, we walk them through the actual implementation of putting the pieces together kind of in a step-by-step -step process uh, that builds the model from sort of piece by piece uh, getting that diagram put together to get all the pieces connected, getting it translated into this uh, stock and flow concept that uh, looks at the uh, behavior over time and uh, finally gets it implemented from, from the mathematical standpoint. Um, <clears throat> just to uh, sort of give you a, a translation, um, the, the way we calibrate this model because remember I said we have to start sort of from a baseline, is to make some assumptions about the values of all of those uh, index uh, pieces. So we uh, go through that computation that I showed you from uh, the qualitative to quantitative um, translation. Those numbers go in the model and we do some uh, linear interpolation that uh, actually produces the final index values for us that go into the model. That gives us that baseline that everything is now dependent on. And uh, as long as nothing changes in that time frame, that baseline is good. So this is part of the concept called validation. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, discussion about, well, is your model valid? Um, that goes to how you developed it, what assumptions you made, and how you uh, set up its, um, its structure and its computational piece. Um, creating this, this baseline and showing that it matches real world data is part of that validation process. And so I'll show you in a minute how that part looks. Um, uh, so that you can show, yeah, my model does represent what's happening in the real world. That becomes then the baseline to do this predictive analysis downstream. Uh, and uh, uh, given that those assumptions aren't uh, invalidated, um, you have uh, some confidence that what you're looking at has some uh, reasonable explanation to what could occur in the future. So. Uh, remember I talked about the time period. So from 1993 to 2001, you see this uh, jagged line here. 
Uh, those were the actual data points that we had for the number of insurgents that existed in Colombia. And based on our indices, we calibrated the model. And what the model produced is this red line that uh, fairly closely matches the number of insurgents that uh, were real world data uh, uh, provided. Uh, so now we have this model that is calibrated to this set of information. And remember I said in 2001 when Aribe came into power, uh, lots of policies changed. So we had to go back and reevaluate all of those indices values that I talked about. So all 128 factors had to be looked at again based on these policy changes that Aribe put in place. So now we have different numerical values for those indices uh, based on the, the policies that, that he put in place. Uh, and they affected the polity side, they infect, uh, affected the human factors, uh, they affected uh, counterinsurgency operations, all those kinds of things. Um, that becomes the new input for the model, and we put that in there, allow the model to run and see what it predicts is going to happen uh, based on those policy changes. Remember, we can't go and manipulate the real world uh, except through this modeling piece uh, unless we put these policies in place and see what happens over time. Well, what happened in reality was this jagged line here with the number of insurgents and what the model predicted was this uh, blue line that took into account those changes in the, the polity uh, and the other indices that we developed. Um, what that uh, indicates is that when, when you look at the sort of the difference here, uh, there's about a, only about a 10% difference uh, in the model and reality. That's pretty good from a predictive analysis standpoint when you're modeling social systems that are very complex, that have lots of random events that we can't control for, uh, but still gives us an idea that um, uh, we're on the right track. So uh, this is an illustration for the students on sort of the power of developing this kind of capability, the methodology that you go through to get it done, and what you can realize from that particular uh, effort. Uh, and then they go and, as part of the course, do their own case study. They pick a topic and uh, uh, apply one of the modeling paradigms using the software, using the capabilities that they learned during the class to come up with uh, that particular piece. I'll, I'll get questions at the end. Um, graduate, graduate this is a graduate course. Um, so um, just kind of a, a summary of what I've talked about. Um, we. Uh, help them identify this question, this, what do they want to model, um, help understand uh, how to uh, visualize where they want to go, uh, how to employ simulation from a test and a retest of a hypothesis. Uh, in this case, uh, learn a little bit about system dynamics, modeling paradigm, the, uh, the Vensim uh, software, and uh, uh, get all of that put together in sort of a, a process to do this kind of modeling. Uh, this is not uh, limited to social kinds of uh, systems. Uh, w the course is actually being taught right now during the semester and our students are going to present their projects in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we, we are always amazed at the, uh, the projects that they come up with. So I'll give you an example of a couple of them. Um, one of the students is trying to model how the Beatles music ended the Cold War. 
um, interesting connection. <laughs> uh, there was a documentary done uh, that was entitled How the Beatles Music Rocked the Kremlin. And she's using sort of the basis of that to uh, show from a modeling perspective how that music had that particular influence. We've got another student that is looking at um, uh, the um, factors that could improve uh, maternal fetal health in Africa. Uh, and the different kinds of factors from both a, a health aspect and a, a political aspect that could better uh, provide for that level of health care and what kind of policies maybe could be put in place to make a positive effect in that particular uh, area. So uh, it's not limited to these political kinds of things, it's really uh, whatever you think you want to look at from a problem standpoint, um, maybe we can look at from the concept of modeling and simulation to one better understand and maybe help solve from a problem standpoint. So we certainly thank uh, CLT uh, for providing some funding for the, the software capability and uh, allowing us to uh, that to put together this, uh, this course for modeling global events that uh, uh, really tries to cut across the university from a, a multidisciplinary standpoint. So with that, I will certainly be glad to take any questions that you may have. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you have to wait for the microphone. Uh, the students who are signing up for this course, do they have any math prerequisites? And what kind of majors are usually signing up? And how many students do you usually have in the course? OK, so the, the question is, uh, any math background and uh, what kind of uh, students are signing up? Um, you have to have a background in uh, college algebra. Um, you don't need calculus. Um, we'll help you through the, the mathematical piece. Uh, the biggest challenge is to craft some uh, algebraic representations of the models, but we help you through that kind of process. Uh, we get students from all kinds of backgrounds. We, uh, we, we get the MSVE students, we get the international studies students, we've had political science students, we've had some students from health sciences, we've had some students from business, so a, a wide variety of backgrounds um, because they get to figure out how to apply this in their in interest area. Okay. Uh, next one for the microphone. I just uh, one question. Uh, and are you planning to have some sort of workshop, which is like a kind of a crash course for like three, four days, classes or something, which will give like especially for the researcher and the faculties. Um, uh, we don't have that specifically planned, but certainly would be very willing to do that. Um, if there's interest in that kind of thing, um, um, I'm certainly willing to put that together and uh, offer it uh, to whatever faculty are interested. Uh, we, have, we have done short courses in this, mainly for uh, business and uh, government folks, and so uh, we really actually have the material already together that we could do that. because we might uh, need such such thing, such a interesting thing and we are really uh, working towards this especially in the research sure yeah uh, um, if you can contact me uh, maybe we can figure out how to set something up for the faculty to offer for them yeah okay. yep. and I, I just want to say this is really exciting and uh, the possibilities were just flitting through my mind um, <laughs> With, with the software, said it's free to students. Is it just free to students in that class, or is it free to all students? Free to all students. Yeah. Yeah. John, I was I was curious uh, with you. You have your Likert scales for the each of the 128 different things that were identified. How do you weight the relative importance of those? Because they, right. you know. Different pieces could be much more uh, fundamental to and, and cause a bigger change than others. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, w one of the things I didn't talk about was 
the, the relative importance of all of those variables. And so that's where the weighting does play an important role. Uh, in this case, for the students, we kept it very simple and assumed a, uh, a constant, or the, the sim same weight for all of the variables. Um, doing this from a, a real world study standpoint, you would absolutely have to account for those variable weightings. Um, so yeah, that's a very important piece of that. In the past, when I've heard people talk about integrating modeling and simulation into various kinds of courses, um, they've usually been talking about doing it on the cheap, where basically they take a canned model that someone has produced and let the students tweak the input parameters and observe the outputs. You're describing, obviously, a much you know more elaborate process of having the students develop uh, the model themselves. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to what you think the difference is in the value that students gain from that, and uh, also, are th is it possible to scale this down to an intermediate stage somewhat for use in undergraduate courses or where this would only be one of a number of different topics that had to be covered? Sure. Um, I think the value in this approach is uh, learning the conceptual modeling piece. Uh, so with a canned problem, you're already given the model. You don't go through the exercise of developing it. That's the hard part. Um, modeling is both an art and a science. Uh, so it takes some insight into understanding what you're trying to model. So you have to do some background research to, to get that understanding or to engage a subject matter expert that has that understanding. Uh, and then you have to be able to translate that into uh, some form uh, that is, allows for some systematic analysis, whether it's system dynamics or agent-based modeling or game theory or discrete event simulation. Um, the students that do the CAN problems don't get that piece, and that is the critical piece. Uh, so at least in, in my view, um, in the first case, we're only teaching them to use a tool. In this case, we're really teaching them about how to model something from a conceptual standpoint and then how to convert that to uh, uh, a, a working simulation. Uh, we can certainly do this at, at any level. Um, uh, as long as um, the, uh, the, the algebra background is there, uh, certainly do it at the undergraduate level, uh, and we can um, pick an easier case <laughs> um, to, to go through that still gets to those same kinds of concepts. So in terms of the modeling, the, uh, the goal is to create a descriptive or a predictive model. And if you are to, to create a predictive model, how can you ensure that it actually predicts? Because you're using the same, like, it's like using one data point, right? You, it seems like, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe I'm, I'm yeah. mis but it's like uh, it's one country through a, through a series of years, then it, you come up with the model, uh, and then you only have that. It's not like you can really manipulate in real circumstances. So how? Is it possible to make the model predictive, or should we stick with the descriptive? <laughs> yeah, well, um, remember, it goes back to my um, comment about Godel. Um, so it's never going to be absolutely 100% predictive be uh, if it contains any kind of truly random elements. Um, but it certainly will provide, I think, an insight into what's likely to occur. Um, and the model from this insurgency standpoint really is applicable to any kind of insurgency you want to look at. So when we, when we built this thing, we really looked at uh, a whole history of insurgencies that occurred over several hundred years, pulled out all of the common elements that uh, we identified for that period of time that influenced insurgencies and put that in the model then you can choose which ones are relevant for a specific case. So you can take this model and analyze it for insurgencies in Iraq or Afghanistan or uh, pick another country. Uh, the, the 
model itself is still relevant. It's just the data that changes. Okay? Right, you show like a several, you know, like a flow chart. Yes. And then somehow you show some connection between this piece and the other piece, like uh, this one. Uh -huh. Now, let's say from engineering, the connection between two or three parameters or variable can be established, either law, physics, thermodynamic, or it could be simple equation, could be algebra, could be whatever. Yes. But in the political science thing, let's say, how do you come up with those equations? Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, so. That's the art part of the modeling. Um, what uh, what we do um, is one of two things. Uh, there may be some theory out there that says this is sort of the computational way to represent this that that somebody has already looked at. And so, if that's the case, we'll we'll borrow from that theory. Uh, if it's if it's not the case we really look at how the whole system is behaving. And so we make some assumptions about what the values should be and how they should be combined together to produce a, a value that is uh, reasonable for describing this particular variable. So um, it, it's more about um, uh, the, the level of influence among the variables, uh, not so much about the specific meaning of the value itself. So uh, it, it's different than in the engineering part where you have a, uh, an equation or um, a set of, of values that absolutely describe this outcome. Uh, these are much more intangible uh, and, and relative, relativistic rather than absolute. Other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much for your attendance and certainly thank you for the support that we've gotten from the university.